you dream of a classroom where learning is natural? Can we inspire students to lifelong learning? What exactly is the purpose of an education? Inspiring students to be curious, independent, creative, innovative, deep thinking, confident, proactive, collaborative, determined, educated. Rise to the challenge of changing the world. This is teaching. This is learning. This is who we are. Welcome to the Tabletop Inventing Podcast. How does a classroom knucklehead become the Teacher of the Year? From the perspective of a statewide Teacher of the Year, what skills create the best teachers? What is the relationship between teaching and learning? What lessons can a teenager learn from 100,000 volts? Do small children really make the best scientists? Listen in to today's podcast to learn the answers to these and other fascinating questions. Hey there, Innovation Nation. The holidays are upon us. I hope that you're enjoying this time of year as much as I am. (laughs) My kids are being all secretive, and we've always got a roaring fire burning in the fireplace to drive off the chill. (laughs) It does strike me as funny that the tech guy, like me, heats with wood. But actually, I'm also a frontiersman at heart. So the idea of four feet of snow and wolves and grizzly bears scratching at the cabin door always makes my heart race a little and fires up a little bit of a wild look in my eye. But then, I remember I only live 10 minutes from the nearest Target shopping plaza. Anyway, let's shift gears to give a couple of shout-outs to our iTunes reviewers. WebDevInst says, This is a diverse and rich set of perspectives on education and innovation. Very worthwhile podcast subscription. And QVMS Math Girl says, In the merry-go-round world of public education, there are few authentic opportunities to discuss and debate the purpose of an education. I love that you have captured thoughtful conversation. Thank you as always, Innovation Nation, for the high praise. We are glad to serve you. And in the interest of continuing those authentic opportunities to discuss and debate the purpose of an education, I'd like to diverge for a few moments. Last week, Jeff Wiggs dove pretty deep into the murky waters of bad experiences in the educational system. This week, we get to hear from Josh Stumpenhorst, a.k.a. Stump Teacher, who was named Illinois Teacher of the Year in 2012. Before we dive into today's interview, this juxtaposition of bad educational experiences and great teachers begs a question. What exactly is the Tabletop Inventing Podcast position on the state of education and the value of formalized education? (laughs) The honest answer is that the jury is out on the state of education. We're only 15 episodes into an exploration of that very question, what is the purpose of an education? However, I do have a couple of thoughts. First, I myself have been a product of the American education system all the way into graduate school and beyond. I would have to say that my experience was mixed. I had good teachers and bad teachers. Second, from the guests on our show, we have heard from those who have been very successful as a result of their education, while it seems that others have done very well in spite of their educational experiences. One of the main purposes of this podcast is to shine a spotlight on the U.S. education system and ask the hard questions. And sometimes we're going to find that things have gone well, and sometimes we're going to find those areas that aren't so good. However, I need to stop right here and point out a critical difference between the education system and the educators who make it run. I have had the privilege in my career of knowing hundreds of K-12 educators. My overwhelming opinion is that they are the only reason the U.S. education system is still standing today. Without the dedication and hard work of teachers like the ones I know, the system would come apart at the seams. I personally know educators who spend thousands of dollars a year on their classrooms and their students' education because the system isn't providing them what they need. Many teachers like this are dumping money right back into the very system that is paying for their service. Now that is dedication. So in honor of the hardworking American teacher, we offer today's interview with the award-winning Josh Stumpenhorst. Long may dedicated teachers stand between students and the devastating effects of ignorance. Our guest this week is Josh Stumpenhorst. Uh, Josh is first and foremost a teacher at Lincoln Junior High in Naperville, Illinois. In addition to uh, being a junior high social sciences and ELA teacher, he also coaches eighth grade basketball in the track team. And 
does a little consulting and traveling on the side. But he really wanted us to emphasize that he is a teacher. Josh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, you know, you're right. I'm a teacher. I've been teaching. This is my uh, 12th year. I've been in the same situation capacity since I've started. I've been a sixth grade social studies, language arts, ELA, English teacher uh, that entire time. Same building, um, same team. You know, I've been coaching, you know, like you said, for the 12 years. I, I really like what I do. I, I, have, I wear a lot of hats, but, uh, you know, that's, that's really who I am. I'm a teacher. I'm surrounded by it. I have two small sons, third grader and first grader. My wife's a teacher. So uh, education is what we live and breathe around our, around our house. Excellent. So how long did you say you'd been a teacher? Uh, this is my 12th year. 12th year. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite part about teaching? Oh, you know, um, you know whenever, whenever I get asked that question, it's kind of a difficult question because, you know, the generic, I love working with the kids. But I kind of take it a whole a different level than that. But I love getting to know the kids. You know, I, I feel good about when I can connect with a kid on a personal level because there are – you know, you've always, you always see that, that kind of famous quote about everybody's kind of fighting a battle and you never know what it is. And, and I kind of take that personally with every kid that walks through my door. And that's when I get the greatest joy when a kid knows that they can connect and trust what we're doing in school and trust in me as their teacher. And, and that does give me the greatest joy because I recognize everybody says, you know, that light bulb moment. Well, some kids aren't going to necessarily master my content, you know, due to a whole, you know, a variety of reasons. But if I can connect that kid and make learning and make school a positive place to me, that's the great part about my job. You know, when I have that kid that would never come to school, was absent 20, 30 percent of their, you know, fifth grade year, and he, he or she finds a connection with me or with the school uh, and, and wants to be there, to me, that's, that's the greatest thing about what I do is, is finding a way to get kids to be positive about school and positive about learning. So when did you first know you were a teacher? Um, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I actually went to college not to be a teacher. Uh, I went to um, a, a college to play basketball and get a journalism uh, degree because I just wanted to be a sports writer. Uh, and that was kind of my, you know, that, that's what I wanted to do. I wrote all through high school for our local paper under a, a pen name. And uh, that was a good time. and I enjoyed doing that. And then when I got to college, I kind of did some volunteer work. Uh, and one of the programs I kind of got involved with at um, the college I went to, which was North Central College, uh, which is in Naperville, um, I did some volunteer work with a group they had called Junior Senior Scholars. And it was kind of like a summer camp, but they had um, the kids, these kids came to campus during the school year as well, once, once every other week or so. And these were kids that were from uh, inner city of Chicago, uh, as well as another neighboring high poverty suburb. And so these were kids that had seen and experienced things that I, I never had growing up in a, a very, very rural town of about 900 people. Um, and, and I worked with them and I got kind of involved in this program and just kind of realized, man, this is this is what I want to do. You know, I loved working and helping kids and, and connecting, you know, with them and learning with them and just something about it just kind of, you know, unlock something with me that I, I can be a teacher and write. And I always had a love for history. So I just, I went that route and I, and I went down that road and, and became a, you know, a teacher really because I just, when I got into that setting, you know, it's kind of one of those things, it's tough to describe, you know, you think, you know, a calling or whatever you want to say, but it was, it was just kind of a light bulb moment working with those kids that this is what I was kind of, I felt good about it. And this is what I wanted to do. Wow. That's, that's a powerful way to get introduced to teaching. So did you yeah. go back then and change your major or? No, the good, the good thing was it was fresh. It was, it was, it was freshman year. So I, nothing was really settled anyway. <laughs> so, you know, freshman year is so much gen ed anyway. So it really didn't set me back. I still got out in the four years. I went through and did all my, you know, the funny thing is I did my observations and practicums and student teaching in the building that I currently work at. And, and the, the beauty of it is when I was, when I uh, graduated, I think there was eight or nine teachers that retired in the building uh, where I was student teaching and two or three coaches. So I literally was able to walk into a position teaching and coaching my first year out. And I had a lot of that, you know, kind of rapport built with the staff because I'd been there, you know, two years, essentially, my full year of senior year, you know, student teaching. And then the year before as a junior doing these observations in that building. So it was kind of, you know, just just a perfect situation. And I continued working with the junior senior scholars for all the four years I was there. 
Uh, and I still look back on those, those, you know, those initial moments with those kids very, very fondly. So when you first started teaching the students, did you find that it was a natural or did you find that you had to spend a lot of time adjusting your natural interactions with the students? Um, you know, it's funny that a lot of people say, you know, they get out of college and they go and start teaching and they, oh man, I knew what I was doing. I was an expert and I didn't feel that way at all. I was scared out of my mind. I remember my first class because I was predominantly a, a history teacher. That's what my degree was technically in with social science. And I had an endorsement in English because that made me more marketable. And in the district I work in, all of our junior high teachers are, are dual subjects. So every junior high teacher teaches two uh, two subjects. So I was a language arts and social science. And I felt very confident in my knowledge base. But in terms of connecting with kids, uh, it took a little while because it was, you know, you kind of walk in that door that first day of your first year and you kind of look at these, you know, 20 some 30 kids and you just kind of go, oh, geez, what do I do now? You know, you, all, the, all the, 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 the best laid plans go out the door when the kids are sitting there. And and it, and it was it scared me to death there that for those first several days, even in weeks. And and, you know, I remember back to one of my very early education classes in, in college where they talk about that survival phase, you know, your first year or two or three, depending on how long it lasts, that you're just trying to keep your head you know, above water. And, and I felt that. And, and I wish I could go back and, and shake myself, my first year teacher self and, and kind of some of the things that. You know, I think as teachers, when we start in our profession, we look at, you know, our own experiences, you know, whether that's survivor bias or whatever. But we look at how we were educated uh, in a lot of those, you know, the pedagogy, the, the, the philosophies we, we put into place with our own classes. And, and I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I would have known what I know now, you know, in, in the way that I approach the kids, the approach, the content and everything. But I think that's just kind of the evolution and the process of being a teacher. You start and you you hope that you continue to evolve and stay relevant and stay, you know, in the best interest of the kids. Well, I, I have a confession to make. So on, <laughs> if you go, if you go Google me, you'll, you'll find out that uh, I'm a physicist. And, uh -huh. you know, we started this little company a couple of years ago. And I'm actually a reluctant teacher. It took me a while to come back to teaching. And I, I if I, if I'm any good, and I don't, I'm, I'm not convinced that I am. Is because of my wife. She's a natural born teacher, and after listening to her, I mean, I can. Sometimes you can just tell someone they belong as a teacher. Yeah. And you know, sometimes it takes an experience for them to figure it out. It sounds like that's what happened to you. You kind of had to do the trial by fire, and then realize, oh wow, I, I really am really good at this. And it, and if I just change my perspective, um, I didn't have that same feeling. And I I have a minor in education, and I got out and when I did my minor uh, they put the student teaching last and the problem is is if I had done that first I'd have said wow I'm just not sure I'm the right guy for this <laughs> mm -hmm. I was yeah. really I was really uncomfortable I had no idea how to manage a classroom and I'm not sure if I uh, I'm not sure if I punked out I'm not I'm not sure how to think about that I, I skipped out went to graduate school in physics I thought that was actually easier than going into the classroom <laughs> <laughs> As crazy as that might sound, you know, so I admire you for sticking it out and figuring it out. And, and I, I mean, teachers are some of the best people I know. And I'm actually curious how many of them would tell the same story you just told. Yeah, I think a lot would, at least the honest ones would, you know, and it's funny because I'm I have, I have a book coming out in, in March and I, it's in the copy edit phase. And I was just talking to a colleague about it today. And it's a big piece of that is this evolution that we go through as teachers um, and that I feel as though the really, really good teachers, and again, I'm not going to put myself in that category. That's for somebody else to do or not do, but the great teachers I've been very fortunate enough to work with, uh, I see them change to meet the needs of the kids in their room that year and that they're flexible and they evolve and they're not the same year to year. And, and I've worked with teachers that don't evolve. Uh, they're teaching the same way in year 27 as they did in year one. And, and that's a problem. And so I think that the really good teachers, some of them aren't, ne aren't necessarily natural. They're, they're reluctant. They don't think they can do it. But there's some people that just have that natural ability to connect with kids and with, with other adults, too. And I find that those are the people that, that make the best teachers because they're constantly looking at ways to connect the kids to that content. Um, and yet there are people that are super, super brilliant content experts 
that sometimes miss that connecting with the kids, which I think can take their content knowledge to a much deeper level. And so, yeah, I think it is a process. And I think a lot of teachers would probably look back, or at least I would hope, look back at their first year and go, man, I kind of want to apologize to all of those kids, you know, at some level or realize that I, I could have done better. And, and, I, and I think that every year I look back at last year even and say I could have been better, you know, and I look forward to next year thinking I want to be better and I'm going to be better. And that's just kind of a philosophy I have. And that's what I try to push other people to see that way as well. So I'm going to take a little bit of a left turn on you, but uh, stay in the mm -hmm. subject of teaching here. So if, as you look back over from the time you started teaching until now, do you feel like there have been any changes in the system? Is the system easier or harder to work in now or the same uh, than when you started? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, if you had asked me last year, it would have been a much different answer. This year, I would say... I'm going to, I'm going to sit on the fence and say it's, it's easier and harder. And, and I'll, I'll explain both. I think it's harder depending on your, your situation because of the new evaluation tools that a lot of districts are going to. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it's definitely harder. Uh, from a very, you know, simplistic, uh, I'm doing paperwork now than I ever did. And I don't know if that's good or bad yet. I'm in a lot more meetings. I'm analyzing a lot more standard work with the new Common Core. And so the system, it's 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 harder right now to be a teacher. And and I, I, I sadly see a lot of teachers I work with or interact with that because the system has become harder are, are leaving the profession or are considering leaving the profession, which I find, you know, obviously incredibly, you know, upsetting and sad because there's some fantastic educators leaving. On the other end of that, in terms of easier, I think that in this or better, it, it, a, lot, a lot of it, and I always use this kind of example of it's about the people, not the programs or the system, because I have a fantastic administration, uh, and I'm not just saying that, I really actually mean that. Um, my superintendent, my principal, and everybody in between them are incredibly supportive of what teachers do. And I have worked for administrators who have not, I would not define that way. And so when you have a situation where you have that leadership, then the system is incredibly difficult to navigate because they're not there to help you with all of the changes going on right now with Common Core, with park assessment or what, you know, pick your pick your poison there. Having great administrators and great colleagues makes navigating that system and makes it a little bit easier. You know, earlier on in my career, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there wasn't all this stuff going on. People just taught. But in some regards, that was harder because I feel as though there's a lot more breaking down of silos within schools, or at least I see that in my situation, where teachers that taught in their room and you never knew what was going on were getting out more, were, were peer observing, were connecting via social media, whatever, the, whatever it is. And so I think that's making, although the system is getting more convoluted and maybe more complex and potentially stressful, I'm seeing a more you know, intentional effort for teachers, at least in my district, to connect and help each other out and therefore making it easier. So I don't know if I just danced around that issue at all. But uh, <laughs> so, so, so yes and no. But I also will say that my wife, who teaches in a different district, will probably have a very different answer because her district, in, in, in her opinion and in my opinion, are not handling it maybe the changes that are going on in education in a very uh, efficient or, or even a positive way. And a lot is getting dumped on teachers, and we're seeing wholesale teachers leaving because the system is, is just so out of whack and it's not being kind of, uh, there's no assistance within, within the district. So I think it, a lot of it depends on the, the setting that you're in and the context because some districts are doing it very well with all the new things that are coming and some are just, for lack of a better term, they're botching it completely. Well, I mean, I, I don't know that this is different than in any other industry or uh, time in history. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think that you can always trace things that are going well to good leadership. You know, it's uh, by the same token, you can kind of flip that around when things are not going well. It's probably a result of bad leadership. And it's hard for us as leaders to take that, you know, seriously. I mean, I, I didn't actually take it that seriously until I started a company and then realized, wow, if things go badly. It's my fault. And if they go well, it, you know, it may or may not be up to me. It may be that I have a good staff, but if I don't take responsibility when things are bad to turn it around, I, no one else is going to do that. And that's a hard place to be sometimes, particularly if you didn't create the problem. I mean, 
I'm sure a lot of administrators are finding themselves in this position where they're finding themselves with teachers that are frustrated with some of the you know current systems and they're having to figure out well how do we navigate this to help teachers you know be able to survive and it sounds like in your district they're doing a good job of that they're actually uh, coming up with systems that work and helping teachers navigate and you know setting up systems that allow teachers to do what they do well which is teach yep and and I think that we often confuse that that you know when you look at that that's you know the top down stuff that's coming down and administrators and leaders that do a really good job of you know helping teachers navigate that and still giving them the autonomy to do their job and trust them to do their job and i think of that same relationship with a good teacher and their students i have more standards now than i have to teach than i've ever taught before due to the common core i have this park assessment looming in you know in a few months here and and i don't want that stress to be on my kids I still want them to have that autonomy in their learning. And so just as an administrator needs to give me that autonomy as a teacher, I think that translates down to students as well when we talk about the way as a teacher we interact with them. Yeah, I hear this a lot. And I don't get this to, to talk to people as much about this as I'd like to, but you know, hearing what you said about uh, being treated like a professional, mm -hmm. I mean, Teachers go to school for four years just like everybody else, or they have a master's degree just like everybody else, and then you get into a, a teacher situation, and you're not always treated like you know what you're doing, which is kind of, you know, you get micromanaged a little bit. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not the only industry where people are micromanaged, but it happens to be a particularly important one for us to pay attention to not micromanaging, you know, simply because I, I never thought of it the way you said it, but if you're micromanaged, the the tendency is to micromanage your kids. Well, the problem is this education breaks down when that happens. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. But I also think that there's no such thing as a blanket statement that's going to work. <laughs> you know, we we look at, and, and I'll use an example that, that my own principal, we talk about, if you have our staff, I think 60 some teachers in our building, I don't even know what the number is completely, but unless you have 60 teachers and there's two teachers that are having an issue or are doing something they shouldn't be doing, then you go and talk to those two. You don't make a blanket statement to the staff and, and lock down the entire staff. You know, we have yeah. um, teachers that aren't following the curriculum, let's say. The answer isn't to mandate and micromanage all of the teachers. The, the solution is to go to those teachers who aren't following protocol and, and handle it that way. You know, it's kind of like, oh, Johnny's talking in class. The entire class loses recess. Yeah. You know, a, a, good t a good teacher would never do that, but... Yet, I think sometimes our leadership, they, they, they lead through the masses or direct through the masses. And I don't know that that's always going to be, you know, then you're going to burn out the people who are doing their job to begin with and make it harder for them, which is not, I don't think, what you want. Well, I'm going to uh, take a left turn again. One of the questions we mm -hmm. like to get to in our podcast here uh, centers around this issue that the digital world has significantly impacted uh, education and students can do things now prior to coming to class or after uh, leaving class that they just and, and they have access to information they just never had access to before and in some cases that might make them look smarter than they actually are and in some cases it gives them the opportunity to maybe learn things they couldn't have ever learned any other way in that environment I mean, what, what does it mean to be educated in that environment in terms of in the educated in this new environment that's there, both at home and at school? Yeah, when we say we're educated or student, you know, we, we say we're educating students. What I mean, in that environment, in that context, what is an education in that context? Well, you know, it's funny because I don't think, I don't think education should be our goal. I think we're very good at educating kids in our, in our current system, but I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. And, and what I mean by that is that Oftentimes, educating a kid means creating a student who conforms to a certain set of ideals or a certain pre-described set of content, you know, standards in a somewhat robotic fashion. You know, we're going to create these little career and college ready kids and they'll be able to do X, Y and Z. But what I fear is that we're not teaching kids to learn. We're going to teach kids to memorize, teach kids to acquire these skills. But there's the, the, the most important skill of thinking and, and learning, I think, and I'm afraid, is being lost on teachers that are doing this intense standardization in districts and states that are trying to do this. Educating a kid is great, but I want them to be able to learn. 
you know, it's very easy to educate a kid through our systems and, and create this product, but I'm not okay with that. I think about my own children. I want them to be learners. Um, and I use an example for my, my son who's in first grade this year. The teacher sent home this lovely little, you know, the welcome letters that teachers send home. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your little sunshine at home to get us, you know, allow us to know them a little better. And one of the questions on there was, you know, what is your goal for your son uh, for the year or for your child? And my goal I wrote on there was, uh, I want my son Caleb to love going to school on the last day of school as much as he does on the first day. Because he loves going to school and he loves learning. And as schools, if that's our goal, if we want them to be continual lifelong learners, then that should be our goal. And I look at how many kids I see by the time they get to me in junior high that hate school. They hate the process of learning as we do it in school. And for lack of a better term, they've been kind of brainwashed into these systems and micromanaged so much that they don't know how to step out and have an independent thought. And yet you take that same kid that shuts down at school because he's been beat down by the system or whatever you want to call it. You take that kid at home and you sit down with him while he's building something in Minecraft and you talk to him about what he's doing. And you'll be blown away by the level of intelligence and the, the, the depth of thought that that kid can have. And so that's where I often get, you know, when we talk about education, and it's funny because I'm working with a committee in my district right now, and we're talking about as we move even further down this, you know, rabbit hole of technology, that that line between home and school, you know, learning is really starting to blur. Um, when kids are going to be able to bring devices in and out of the buildings that, that they own, whether it's their own personal device in a BYOD or if your district is fortunate to go one-to-one. And so education is going to look very different. And, I, and I'm hoping and I'm pushing that we get back to what, what learning's about. You know, I think we're obsessed with the data. We're obsessed with these assessments that I don't think measure learning. I think that is measure how much content you're able to regurgitate on a test. And so I think we got to find a balance. And that's always been my push and will always be my push is that education's fine, but we got to create learners. we got to create thinkers. And I don't necessarily think school is always – is always doing that as, as well as we possibly could. It sounds like you just grabbed a line straight out of Piaget. I, uh, <laughs> I was just, uh, someone sent me a quote yesterday, and this is uh, by Piaget. It said, education for most people means trying to lead the child to resemble the typical adult of his society. Mm-hmm. But for me, education means making creators. You have to make inventors, uh, innovators, not conformists. Yeah, and I, and I agree with that, and I think that a lot of teachers want students to behave as though they did when they were students because, and again, I don't blame teachers for this. We have our own preconceived notions. We have our own bias of what we were like when we were in school, which is why I kind of have a soft spot for the knuckleheads because I was a bit of a knucklehead in school, <laughs> and, and so, so I get those kids, and, and so a lot of the, I think, and this is my opinion, that a majority of teachers teach in the manner in which they were taught, and they don't know what they don't know, and it's not their own fault. They just, that's the way they were taught, so that's what they assume. And and in doing so, I think we're missing out on a tremendous opportunity to take advantage of all these digital tools and all these other things that are going on to really transform, and I know that's an overused word right now in education, but really transform the learning experiences for kids you know, I use this example a lot. You look at from the technology standpoint, when, when I was a kid, um, which, you know, I'm not terribly old, but I look at, you know, the very early, you know, apples that we were using in the big old floppy disks. The iPad the kids are holding right now, that's their floppy disk. You know, when these kids move on and they're getting into high school and college and adulthood, they're going to look back at those and that's going to be the most antiquated piece of equipment they ever had. And so, we have to shift our thinking about what we're doing and what we know about brains and how they function and how kids are learning and and the research that, you know, Jane McConaughey is doing with games. I mean, there's just so much out there right now that it's, to me, it's almost insulting uh, that we continue teaching in the way that we have for the past 20, 30, or even 50 years. (laughs) Well, I will uh, resist the urge to talk about uh, maker tools, which is kind of my hobby horse because I'm a, a maker, but... Yes, I completely agree with that. But I, I don't want to keep you too much longer here, so I'm going to ask mm-hmm. you one final question. Okay. And you've already sort of answered it, so uh, maybe just help us wrap this in a neat little package. In a concise sort of statement, what is the purpose of an education? Huh. What I think it should be is, and I don't agree with the 
college and career readiness, to be honest with you. I think the purpose of education should be to create thoughtful and engaged citizens. And, and, I, and I say that in that I want whatever route a kid takes when they walk out of our schools and are quote unquote educated to be successful in whatever they're going to do and be a functioning member of society, knowing that kids are going to be in the society in various, you know, various levels, whether it's your, your doctors, your, your grocery bag clerk, you know, whatever it is, I want kids to be able to walk out of our schools and, and their education to mean that they can, they can function in society in, in a thoughtful manner and, and be able to think that's my biggest and greatest fear. And, and I, I blame my good friend, Chad Miller in Hawaii, who I was just recently with. And he, he's a philosopher and, and he just talks about this generation of kids that, and he blames a lot of it on the standardization movement of content and so much drill and skill and, and not creating thinkers and kids that are going to question kids that are going to, you know, inquire about things and be skeptical of things and really examine their existence, which the examined life, as they say. Wow. I think we should probably wrap that up right about there because that's, <laughs> uh, that's a pretty clear goal to aim for there. Mm -hmm. Josh, thank you so much for taking uh, time with us. I'm going to ask you to stick around a little bit uh, after we sure. wrap it up here. But uh, why don't you let us know how people can get in touch with you and mm -hmm. uh, then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty easy with a name like Stumpin' Horse. Google could find me pretty easily. But my entire online existence, my Twitter handle, my YouTube email is all Stump Teacher. So all one word, Stump Teacher. That's my Twitter handle. That's my YouTube. And that's my Gmail. So always happy to connect. I'm a big believer in there's always people out there doing things I'm doing better than me, and I want to learn from them. So connect with me, and I'm happy to connect with you. Excellent. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate you taking some time to talk with us and share your thoughts with our audience. Thanks for having me, Steve. And now, today's great inventor secrets. High voltage learning. In honor of today's guest, I would like to take a few minutes to discuss my passion for tabletop inventing and what I believe to be the greatest inventor's secret of all. Here at Tabletop Inventing, we seek to inspire a new generation to create, innovate, and change the world. We do this by providing exciting and engaging educational experiences such as the Inventors Boot Camp, teacher training for maker education, and great classroom maker tools. However, this is not a plug for our products and services. You can find out more about that on the ttinvent.com website. Instead, I want to tell you my ulterior motives and, along the way, Reveal today's secret. We will start in a very unlikely place. Between my junior and senior year in high school, I worked on a farm for half the summer. My job varied from day to day. Sometimes I drove the John Deere 2355 and raked newly cut hay into rows. Occasionally, I got to drive the farm's John Deere 4030 for disking or plowing. That was my favorite tractor. Every morning, the farmhands showed up at the tractor barn, and we had what we jokingly called a board meeting, in which we got our assignments for the day. My least favorite job to get during the daily board meeting was cleaning the wheat. In the small building with an attached silo located behind the tractor barn was the wheat used by a nearby bakery. We delivered fresh wheat to be ground into flour, and the bread was to die for. The freshness probably had something to do with us cycling the wheat through the silo periodically to make sure it dried properly and didn't have rocks, weed seeds, or bugs in it. However, the process was really boring after the first 10 minutes. We would start by augering the wheat from the bottom of the silo into a holding bin inside the small building that held the cleaning, winnowing, sifting machine. I can't remember exactly what we called it, but it was about the size of two or three large refrigerators. When the machine was on, it made a terrible racket because it lifted the wheat out of the bin and dumped it into the top of a series of vibrating filters, trays, and fans. The holes in the sifter were carefully sized so that the sifting tray vibrated the wheat and the wheat would slide down along the tilted surface and fall through the holes, or not fall through the holes. Anything that was too large ended up floating along the sifter to the other end and dumped into a waste bin. There were other bits where fans blew, let the light chaff into another waste bin, and finally, 
the cleaned wheat would exit the machine into a tilted PVC pipe. Now, this last part of the machine was the only reason I didn't get bored to death on these days. It was both fascinating and dangerous. The wheat came sliding down the tilted pipe into a centrifugal air pump or centrifugal blower. If you've ever looked at a turbo pump under the hood of a diesel truck or a souped up hot rod, it's the same kind of pump, only about 10 times bigger. The wheat was sucked into the side of the pump and blown with tremendous velocity out the other end of the PVC pipe, back outside and up to the top of the silo. Now that doesn't sound particularly dangerous, except that during the summer, when the air is dry in eastern Tennessee, a tremendous amount of static electricity would build up along that second PVC pipe as the wheat went zinging along back to the top of the silo. Looking back, <laughs> they had essentially created a huge Van de Graaff generator. You've probably seen a Van de Graaff generator, but didn't know it. It's one of those things that look like a little like a mushroom with a aluminum uh, sphere on the top. And science expo centers love to have the girl in the audience with the longest hair come up front and touch the mushroom looking top. The girl's hair inevitably sticks straight up from her head and the audience laughs. I'll link one up in the uh, show notes so you can see what I mean. Well, our oversized wheat turbo pump generated so much static electricity along the 4-inch PVC pipe that it would occasionally zap you from almost a foot away. <laughs> Looking back with the wisdom of a PhD in physics, I have a sneaking suspicion that the voltage on that PVC pipe reached well over 100,000 volts. <laughs> it was spectacular and somewhat terrifying to get zapped by the pipe. It hurt like the dickens, but I discovered that as the pipe exited the building to go back up to the silo, the static dimish, diminished to a tolerable but still significant level. I spent hours watching bugs land on that still highly charged PVC pipe and then extending a long blade of grass toward the bug. As the grass got closer, the bug began to feel a significant force and would try to cling to the pipe. Then, when the grass was almost touching the bug, the static electricity would literally stretch the bug out between the pipe and the blade of grass. Then, in the last instant, a bright blue spark would jump between the blade of grass and the bug, uh, unfortunately usually electrocuting the bug. Now, I'm not here to debate the ethics of electrocuting bugs because it probably falls under the category of incinerating ants with a magnifying glass. Yet, as a curious 17-year-old, I was investigating my world and testing hypotheses just like any scientist. Somewhere in my 17 years, I had learned the skill of observing and teaching of observing things and teaching myself through the process of forming a hypothesis, testing the hypothesis, revising the hypothesis, and testing it again. This is the exact same process used by the best scientists, inventors, and innovators in the world. In education, we like to call it learning how to learn. And it is the most powerful inventor's tool you can have. In fact, once we teach a student how to learn, the best course is to get out of their way so that they can learn more. A student in the throes of curiosity will find it very difficult to do anything else. And a teacher interrupting such a moment is violating some sort of holy ground. Learning to learn is my deep ulterior motive here at Tabletop Inventing. We don't just think it is a good idea. We believe it is the only educational idea that truly matters. That is a strong statement, but consider the pinnacle of education, a PhD. The PhD degree is a successive process of learning how to learn under harder and harder circumstances where the answers are fewer and farther between. In short, a PhD is all about learning how to learn. But there is evidence, which we'll have to wait for in another episode, that children are expert learners, according to Alison Gopnik of Berkeley. I can't spend time in this episode, but Gopnik has studied children and discovered that they are actually the best innovators on the planet. I'll put a link to her TED Talk in the show notes. Anyway, we just have to sharpen our learning experimenting behavior like every other good tool. If you want to be a great innovator, or you want to inspire great innovators, your number one ally is curiosity, and your number one aim is to learn how to learn. A student that learns not just how to learn, but also to inspect their process of learning, 
will be practically unstoppable in their capacity to innovate. We often hobble students by telling them to sit quietly, please, while knowledge is dispensed from the front of the room. When we should really be putting them in situations where they don't know the answer, but can figure it out by building and testing and rebuilding and testing again. If we want to inspire great innovators, it is high time we all learn how to learn. Have you been enjoying the Tabletop Inventing Podcast? Have comments or questions you'd like us to address? Contact us and we'll think through the comments and answer your questions here in the podcast. And be sure to let us know if you'd like a shout out or to remain anonymous. You can share your comments and questions at www.ttinvent.com slash podcast or by emailing us at podcast at ttinvent.com. Let's discuss your thoughts and questions. Join us again next time when we will again seek to answer the question, what is the purpose of an education? And as educators, how do we awaken the inventor in each of our students? Mm -hmm.